Welcome to worship this morning. We're so glad you've joined us at Hurstful Salvation Army for our worship service this morning. Come, people of God, let us offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and lift up his name in presence of his people. For God is gracious and merciful, full of compassion and love. While we were still helpless, he came to save us. Will you join with me in prayer? Father God, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together, to hear from you, to come together with your people to worship and to praise you. Father God, may your presence be felt amongst us all as we meet in our lounge rooms this week. May we be keenly aware of your presence, of what you are speaking and saying to each of us today. Amen. We're going to join together in song now. And we're going to lift our praises to God who is full of mercy and compassion as we sing together, Holy, Holy, Holy. everyone. Since we can't be here together in church, as we've been in lockdown due to the virus, we've missed seeing you face to face and look forward to the day when we can be all together worshipping here at Hurstville through our kids program. I'm reminded of a Bible story found in Mark 4, 35 to 41. It's a story that gives us great assurance that God is in control over all things. 
The story is Jesus calms the storm. One day, Jesus told his disciples it was time to cross to the other side of the sea. Many of his disciples were fishermen and they climbed aboard their fishing boats and began to cross. So, here's our fishing boat. And off they went. Soon, they were in the middle of the storm. The wind began to blow. Ooh, and the sea became rough. Ooh, and the waves got so, 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 so big. It was very, very rocky. There was thunder and there was lightning and the waves were so, so high, soon their boat began to fill with water. They were terrified. Meanwhile, Jesus was sleeping in the boat. The disciples couldn't believe it. They woke Jesus and asked him, don't you care if we drown in the middle of the sea? Jesus stood up and took, told the storm, be still. Instantly the wind stopped, the storm went away, the disciples were in awe. They knew only God could control the weather. They bowed down and worshipped Jesus. They knew he cared and nothing was impossible for him. The world's a bit of a crazy pace at the moment. We can't do things like we normally do. But this story reminds us that whatever situation we are in, God is in control. God has power over all things. He sent his son Jesus to be our friend. Jesus loves you and me. We can take our worries to him in prayer. Jesus cares all about us. Remember, we are all in this together until next time. So let's have a prayer together. Thank you, God, that you are all powerful. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to save us and be our friend. Thank you that you love and care for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks, Nero. What a wonderful kids' time. What a great reminder uh, that God is always with us, even when perhaps we don't first think to rely on him. Thank you also for your giving of your gifts back to God in such a practical way to support our families and their children during the week. We're going to move into a time of giving of our tithes and offerings again this morning. Uh, and we know it's a little bit different at the moment. You might even like to, at this particular time, initiate your online gift. The BSB and account details for, uh, for weekly giving are available in the core newsletter. So uh, if that's a way that you like to give, uh, you might like to do that even now um, as we move into this time of worship. If you'd like to give um, through cartridge or a cash payment, please make contact with the core office on the phone number or emails provided in the core newsletter. So many of us forget sometimes, don't we, just of the wonderful gifts that God gives to us, both financially and practically. And it is a difficult time at the moment for each one of us trying to work out the confusion of the world and where God is at work in that. But we would invite you right now just to draw near, near to Jesus, near to the cross, as Marion brings this beautiful piece of music to us for our time of giving and reflection.
greater law. No greater love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. Love your neighbour as yourself. Love one another as I have loved you. Love that sacrifices all. Sir, would it help if I shed a tear? I swear it's the first time since this time last year. My spine is a tingle. My throat is all dry as I stand to attention for all those who died. I watch the flag dancing halfway down the pole. That damn bugle player sends chills to my soul. I feel the pride and the sorrow. There's nothing the same as standing to attention on Anzac Day. So sir, on behalf of the young and the free, will you take a message when you finally do leave to your mates who are lying from Tobruk to the Somme? The legend of your bravery will always live on. I've welcomed Olympians back to our shore. I've cheered baggy green caps and watched wallabies score. But when I see you marching, sir, in that parade, I know these are memories that will never fade. So, sir, on behalf of the young and the free, will you take a message when you finally do leave? It's the least we can do, sir, to repay the debt. We'll always remember you lest we forget. We'll always remember you, lest we forget. sacrifices his life or his friends. It's been my privilege this week to catch up with a couple of well-loved people in our church community. And I'd like to introduce you to Graham and Lynn Smythe. Um, Graham and Lynn, how long have you been soldiers at Hurstville Corps? Well, all my life, um, since 1948, that's 71 years. Wow. I imagine you've seen some changes in that time as well. A lot. Yeah. A lot of changes. Yeah. And what about yourself, Lynn? How long have you been a part of Hurstville Corps? Oh, since we were married. Lovely. Which was 50, 50 years in September. Yeah, 50 years. A fantastic achievement, guys. And um, I believe something special was meant to happen to celebrate that milestone. Yes, we had planned to go to Hawaii um, this month 
just last weekend, weekend ago, and uh, cruise to Hawaii, stay for a week and then fly home. But of course, like all tra overseas travel or any travel, uh, that's not going to happen. And at the moment, we're trying to reschedule that for next year. Oh, fantastic. So um, one of the reasons uh, we wanted to talk to you guys was um, we've noticed that you've been very creative in um, recreating the trip that should have been. Uh, so what's it been like to be in lockdown and, and not be able to actually take that trip? Um, well, we've been um, trying to keep a positive outlook on things, trying to go for a walk each day, keeping in touch with our family and friends by phone, watching live streaming of yep. our Sunday services. It's been very important. And we're doing our crosswords and Sudoku. Fantastic. Yeah. I'm glad you're getting to have that little bit of exercise as well because um, that's really important to be able to do that. So how are you guys keeping your sense of humour through all of this? Well, because we uh, couldn't go to Hawaii, we decided to post on Facebook some pretty scenes of living the dream. Now, the first photo was meant to be dressed in Hawaiian-style clothes. Due to hilarious replies and suggestions, we have decided to continue the theme and we've enjoying the fun of that. So stay tuned for the next one. Fantastic, we can't wait. And I think it's really encouraging um, for some of us younger folk as well to watch that um, you guys seem to have embraced this part of the season. There's nothing we can do about being locked down but we're so encouraged by the way you've kept your humour and you've been able to embrace what couldn't be and recreate it at home. So 50 years of marriage, that's no mean feat. And um, just wondering what words of wisdom you would have to share with your younger selves or you know, with um, some of our folk who are just recently married. Uh, we come up with um, be true and honest with each other. Tell your spouse that you love them regularly and show it with a hug and oh. a kiss. <laughs> <laughs> Thank your husband and wife for what they mean to you and ask for God's guidance and direction in developing a loving and caring relationship. Yeah, that's fantastic. There's lots of other things we could add. Oh, good. Well, we'll look forward to when we all get back together. You can share those personally with uh, each of us. Yeah. Guys, thank you so much um, for spending time chatting with us. And thank you also for the example that you are to our church family. I know a lot of folk look up to you and um, you're just very godly, very caring people. And we're very grateful for you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We can't wait to be all together again. Sounds great. All right. God bless. This morning, I'm reading from Luke chapter 24. I'm commencing at the 13th verse and reading through to verse 35, if you'd like to get your Bibles. The heading is On the Road to Emmaus. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus about 11 kilometres from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognising him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast, one of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem? Do you not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. 
but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them, what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognised him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is one of the most vivid and insightful accounts of Jesus' appearances after his resurrection. The journey to Emmaus is both a literal and a spiritual journey. On one hand, it recounts the story of two disciples who, after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, walk many miles from Jerusalem to their village of Emmaus. On the other hand, it outlines for us the journey that we all take from not recognising Jesus to understanding what the scripture says about him to recognising him for who he is and finally to us sharing what we've experienced. Although the disciples knew who Jesus was, they didn't recognise him. They knew a lot about him. They'd been witnesses to all those things that had happened in Jerusalem. They had heard things Jesus had testified about himself yet they were not able to recognise Jesus when they met him. When we lived in the Northern Territory, I was part of a team who took our Year 10 students on a three-week educational trip around Australia. As part of this trip, we would stop at the Blue Mountains on our way home. And I'd tell the students about the Blue Mountains, the Three Sisters, the spectacular scenery, the lookout from Katoomba, we wrote about it for them in their Year 10 trip booklet. They knew it was there. They'd heard all about it from us. But out of the seven years I did this trip, only twice did students actually get to see it for themselves. Because while we were there, the fog actually lifted and revealed all we had told them about. The original Greek language in the story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus conveys the sense that the disciples were kept from recognising Jesus because their eyes were blinded. They had a fog that veiled their eyes. And like the fog, the fog gradually lifting uh, in the Blue Mountains, Jesus' gradual revelation of himself allows the disciples to learn certain lessons about trusting God's promises. The disciples had been told about these events many times, but they had not believed. 
The disciples had a preconceived idea of who Jesus was and what he had come to do and how he should actually do it. But when things didn't turn out like they thought they should, they dismissed the whole thing as a mere failure, a misplaced hope and trust. Now, while God always has a plan, we're not always privy to that plan. When things don't turn out like we expect, instead of giving up or admitting defeat, perhaps we would be wise to see things differently, to see if maybe as God, God is up to something that we simply do not understand. You see, the disciples had heard the reports of the women who went to the tomb. They'd seen the empty tomb for themselves and yet they had not believed. The supernatural working of God to raise Jesus from the dead was outside of their thinking. They'd actually never seriously considered who Jesus was. And we need to be careful not to make the same mistake, to discount what God has done simply because we cannot explain or understand it. And while God often uses natural things to accomplish his will, he also does things we can neither explain nor understand. These two disciples knew something had happened, but it was beyond their level of faith to see things as they truly were. Just because they knew about Jesus does not mean that they knew him. Just because they could see him does not mean that they could see who he was. Many people today know who Jesus is. They've heard about him, read about him, use his name. Many even claim to know him. However, they wouldn't recognise him if they saw him. Their eyes have not been opened. Knowing about him and knowing him are two different things. Jesus walked with the disciples and opened to them the scriptures, explaining to them how the Old Testament pointed to him as its fulfilment, taking them through the entire narrative of the Bible to show them, to point for them to who he was, why he had come and why his coming was necessary. Jesus wanted them to see that if they would only believe the script, what the scriptures say about him, they would understand why he came and why he had to suffer. They would know who he was. The scriptures, the Bible, give us an informed understanding of who Jesus is. Reading the whole biblical narrative gives us a complete basis of our faith and a lens through which we can see who Jesus truly is and the personal relationship he wants to have with us. God prevented these two disciples from recognising Jesus to convey a very deep truth. Even if we were to see, we might not still believe. We must, we must both trust the testimony of Scripture and our experience of him. It was only as the disciples had fellowship with Jesus that he disclosed himself to them. Jesus reveals himself to those whose eyes he has opened through the truths of his word, through the scripture. It is not without significance that it is around the supper table that the disciples' eyes are opened and they see Jesus for who he really is. After the resurrection, many of the appearances of Jesus are associated with table fellowship. In the intimacy of fellowship, Jesus reveals himself to us. His working in our lives becomes clearer and his provision and protection come into focus. 
But then, when they recognised him, he disappeared. Fellowship with Jesus was not going to depend on their ability to see him, but rather upon their taking him at his word. And I love their final response. Once they recognised him, they couldn't help but share him. When our eyes have been opened, we want others to have their eyes opened too. Can you imagine the excitement they must have felt? As they walked, they said to one another, did not our hearts burn within us while, we were speaking to, while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? Their encounter with Jesus would have been very emotional. It stirred them from the inside. It moved their very hearts. And once moved, they couldn't help but share. That very hour, dark as it was, late as it was, dangerous as the road was, they left for Jerusalem. They gave witness that Jesus was risen, that he'd walked with them and talked with them, explained the scriptures to them and broke bread at their table. Folks, the experience of the presence of God is not a private gift. It's never for us alone. Do you know Jesus this morning? Have your eyes ever been opened to who he is, what he's done for you? I encourage you to press into fellowship with Jesus. Get to know him, discover him in a new and personal way today and then take that and share it with others. Once again, God's spoken to us, hasn't he? Through his word and through his servant. Let's pray together. Father God, today, right now, we pause. We thank you for the incredible gift of the scriptures, but more so, Lord, the gift of your son. This morning we've heard just the very real real way in which Jesus came to those on the road to Emmaus, those that really hadn't seen him, known him, and he came in a really new and fresh way. And Father, this morning for each one of us, we thank you that we've had the opportunity to come before you, to come to know you afresh, anew. Father, to experience you in a very real way. So Lord, today, would you embrace us encourage us, allow us to speak the truth of who you are to the people around us. During this time where perhaps we might be physically isolated from others, would you just create a a burning desire in our hearts to share your love however we can with the world around us. Thank you for the reality of your son Jesus. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that dwells in each one of us. And Lord, light a fire in us that we might be so invigorated that we would share that with the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are going to share in a final chorus together this morning. And uh, the first verse is an invitation, really, to to declare uh, to the world um, who our Lord is. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, that's who he is, the King of creation, O my soul, praise him. He is our health and he is our salvation and he can be the salvation of the world around us. Let's sing together as we join in these verses and celebrate a risen king.
are blessed that we can continue to worship in this way. And now let me bring a final benediction for us as we go into a new week together. Go now, as those who have met with Christ in the morning of this day. Go now, as those whose hearts have burned within them, as the scriptures were explained to us this day. Go now, as those who have been touched by resurrection itself. And may the blessing of God be upon you, upon your body, mind and spirit, as you continue in this day and in the days to come. In Jesus' name, Amen.